All right, so Numbers, numbers 5, let me pray for us and, and we're going to get going. God, I just help us stay focused on your word this morning. Help us stay focused on what you want us to do in response to what you show us today. Help us worship this morning. When you reveal your ways to us, may we respond appropriately. So help us keep our mind on you. God, I know there's so much going on right now. So many ways our mind could drift because of things going on. But God, you're still on the throne. God, we still can trust you. You're still our rock, no matter where we are, what we're going through. And I just thank you for that, God. I just pray that you would help us today to get exactly what you're feeding us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so before we get into Numbers 5, let's, let's kind of review just, just for a second. Uh, numbers 1, what happened? Census is taken. Census is taken. So we're looking at the numbers, uh, and that's based on war. Okay, so that set the stage of saying, God's saying, I'm launching you as a people into the promised land, the land that I've already promised you. Uh, so we need to count you. How many do we have? That sort of thing. What about numbers two? What happened in numbers two? What was it? You can look back, yeah. Okay. Numbers two... You remember we had all the, yeah, we had the tribes, remember, and you had all of them around the camp. What was the epicenter of the camp? And who was in the epicenter of the tabernacle? So you see you have this holy space in the middle of the camp. So the first, the first chapter is God saying, okay, let's count you. I'm sending you in, flinging you into the promised land. Second one is, I'm in the center the epicenter of holiness, and I want you around me, right? Okay, what about numbers three and four? What did we talk about the last two weeks? That everyone had a role, but we specified talking about the Levites the last couple of weeks, but every one of these people, okay, you have a role in the story, okay? Now, we get into numbers five, and God's, here's the thing. God begins to set rules for holiness within the camp okay that's where we are in the story he's already put the camps around he's given them duties and he says you're surrounding me and i am holy and now we're getting into numbers five where he says by the way if you're going to be around me you've got to learn what it looks like to be holy as well so i'm going to give you some some rules so that holiness is maintained in the camp and so, so we see, and just kind of give you a quick overview, and we're going to dig into this in more detail. The first four verses talking about this separation of people that are unclean. So if you're physically unclean, the first four verses, okay, you need to be put outside the camp. You need to be separated. Then we see verses 5 through uh, 10 that there's these instructions of, and by the way, if some of you have issues with somebody else in the camp, you've got to make it right. You've got to make restitution because in order to be holy, there's got to be things that are fixed within the camp. I don't want you being upset with one another. And then finally, verses 11 through 31 is what? Look at your headings. <laughs> Unfaithful wife. So in your marriages, we need to make sure things are done properly even in your marriages, okay? So, so you have these things, but understand the overarching theme that we're talking about in Numbers 5 is, okay, we have a game plan, we're surrounding God, He's holy, now we've got to learn what it looks like to be holy too. Can I ask a question? Sure. Is there a difference between unclean and clean and holy? There, let's, let's get into that. There... There's a difference between sinning and being ritually unclean, right? If you, if you have a baby, Kristen did not just become sinful because she had Wesley this week. She became ritually unclean in, in the Hebrew sense, but she didn't sin. So there's a difference between the two when you're talking about some of those things for sure. But I think some of that will hopefully come out more as we continue. So let's just start out. Looking at Numbers 5, just the first four verses, it says this. Then the Lord spoke to Moses. What's the word there? Oh. Way to beer. Okay, y'all are going to get this by the end of Numbers, I promise. Way to beer, okay? Lord spoke to Moses saying, Command the sons of Israel that they send away from the camp every leper 
and everyone having a discharge and everyone who is unclean because of a dead person. You shall send away both male and female. You shall send them outside the camp and they will not defile their camp where I dwell in their midst. The sons of Israel did so and sent them outside the camp just as the Lord had spoken to Moses. Thus the sons of Israel did. So there was a, gosh, this is probably, how many years ago was it? Seven maybe? I don't even know. There was years ago, Matt and Bora came over to our house. Do you remember when they came and they were going to be like touring our house? Do you remember? I don't know how many years ago that was. But anyway, I remember one of those things. Of course, it's my family. So Julius looks at me and says, now you've got to get everything cleaned up here. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but, but we, you know, you have to get the house completely clean. And here's the thing. He's never been to our house. I mean, he lives now in Washington, D.C. And, and so, you know, he's going to be going all over, not just like in the living room. So guess what? You start out and you clean everything. I mean, you go and I mean, even like places that you don't, leave, don't normally take people, I know he's going to be touring. So, so it, you do a thorough cleaning job. And so now, just let me let you in on a little secret. If you're going to come to my house, my guess is right now we're going to shut the bedroom door. You're not allowed in there. Uh, definitely not going to go into... Uh, back in that way, we're going to, we're going to give you parameters and the kids rooms upstairs. Okay. They're probably not going to be good either. So don't go up the steps. Okay. Um, maybe downstairs, no one does a pretty good job cleaning his room. So maybe it's okay down there. But other than that, you've got certain rooms you're able to go into, right? But what if you have somebody who's going to completely look at everything? It's a different type of cleaning you do. It just is. Um, I expected my brother and his wife to come and take the grand tour, so I decided, I mean, we, we were like, okay, we got to clean everything. Does that make sense? Okay, I need, I need that to set the stage for what we see here, because in Numbers 5, Numbers 5, God says this. He says, if you have someone unclean, if this is the camp, they got to go outside it. They have to go outside the camp if they're unclean. So, the, so there's, there's three groups of people he mentions. What was the first one? Leper. Okay, hopefully some of you were, will remember Leviticus 13. We did a whole lesson in here on leprosy. And if you didn't, if you were not here, it is up on my YouTube page. You can listen to it because there is some really important things to understand. That Hebrew word was zarat. zarat. Okay, zarat is the Hebrew word for, lep for, for that word. Now, that's not just leprosy. Just reminding some of you who have been here, that's not, what, what's leprosy in the medical terms today for Americans? You might know the other name for it. Hansen's disease, bacterial nasty, nasty disease. They had that, the first record we see of Hansen's disease is 600 B.C. India, China, places like that, we do have records, but no, no not before that. So did we have it at the time of Jesus? Yes. So when they see lepers at the time of Jesus, were they really lepers? Could have been, okay? But, but back then, there is no history of that Hansen's disease. Leprosy in the Bible, in the Old Testament, is skin, it's anything from psoriasis to fungal infections, okay? I mean, it's, I mean, it's, it's a wide range. It's all-encompassing. And Le Leviticus 13 gives you a very specific list of different types of leprosy, Zerat. But if you had even a rash, well, guess what? you got to go outside the camp because we can't defile the camp. We can't risk other people becoming unclean. So that's the second group of people were what? What does it say? Discharge. discharge. Those with a discharge. Now, I remember the morning coming in here knowing I had to talk about discharge of Leviticus 15. And uh, y'all wanted to talk about all kinds of stuff. You know what I let you do? I sat down over here and said, please, y'all keep talking because I don't want to, I mean, I don't want to talk about women discharge and stuff all day. So, and I, I know because uh, Terry Skelton kind of gave me a hard time about that. Yeah, you know what you're talking about. I see you letting them talk. And I was like, yeah, you're right, buddy. But um, discharge, and so, so this, this, now, if you look at the number one cause at that time period of the discharges talking about based on scholars' opinion was gonorrhea. Just, just so you know, there's other types of discharges, but that was the number one at that time. And, but anyway, that had to be isolated, removed from camp. Now, um, if, if God is in the business of trying to say, I want to keep my camp holy, 
he had to remove people that was going to cause contamination among the people. He had to have a system to say, you know what, if you have this discharge, if you have this skin condition, I need you to just for a little while go away until all that's cleared up or it spreads like wildfire, as you can see with certain things going around right now. Third group of people is what? Because they've done what? They've touched a dead body, right? So, so this, this was Numbers, 9, Numbers 19. We'll get to this in greater detail, by the way. So, so um, you don't become unclean just because you touch something that's unsanitary. It's not because they were dead and, oh, that's gross. He may have bacteria on his skin and, oh, that means you're unclean, okay? It's not an unsanitary issue, um, it is something that God says, I need you. And this goes back to Kenny's question. He wanted people that were ritually pure. It's not because they become sinful if they touch the dead body. It's I need a people who are ritually pure. Because if God's holy, anything that is ritually impure couldn't be around him. Okay, so that's, that's, he said, so if you have a physical condition, that's the very first thing he addresses in Numbers 5. If you have a physical condition, I need you away right now until you become more ritually pure. Now, what would happen if the people were not ritually pure around him? What does it say in the text? Yes. That word defile literally means something that is made unfit for its intended purposes. You can't, it can't be used the way it was intended. And God says, if you have anybody ritually impure right here, then, then my place where I live, it can't be used the way it, it needs to be, the way it was designed. So it's unsuitable. So this place now, you cannot even commune with me. If, if that makes sense. If this is his tabernacle, this is where the people commune with God. He says, no more. You can, you can if you have rich, ritual impurity around the tabernacle. So, do you think this was a big deal? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> now, I want you to imagine if my brother came over years ago and he said, Mark, I, um, I'm only going to come over. The only time, I'm only going to grace you with my presence if you clean up your home really, really, I mean, thoroughly clean it. Well, the question is, how bad do I want Matt to come over? Because I could say, no, nah, it's too much work. I'd rather just do what I want to do. And, or do I say, you know what? I really, my brother doesn't get to come over very often. I want to see him. I want to see his wife. And, and then I, I do the work necessary to bring him into my house. Now, he would never say that, obviously. But I just want to get you into this thing because God tells his people, if you want my presence, the only way I'm coming here in this spot is if you clean up the camp. If you take this seriously and clean up the camp, because if not, it'll be defiled and it's not suitable for what, what it's supposed to do. Now, and I think, man, this is God. Of course I would clean it up. Of course I would do what he tells me to do. But if he told you, listen, there are areas in your life you need to clean up. If you want me to move in ways that you haven't seen, if you want me to dwell within you and lead you and guide you as a shepherd, if you want my spirit to have free reign, there are things in your life that you know of, that I've convicted you of. I have convicted you. You have just chosen not to listen to me. What are those areas that we're not cleaning up? And you know you need to. You can't do it yourself. And that's, not, that's a completely different discussion. God convicts you, and he will give you the power, and he's the one that has to do it, but we have to let him because we also have free will. And, and it's so easy for me to say, you know what, God? I'm not letting you clean out this closet. I like this closet. This is, this is, I'll just close the door there. Nobody else will see it. And God says, if you want me to have free reign in your camp, if you want me to commune with you, clean it up. Okay. 
And it, by the way, some, some text that came to my mind as I was thinking about that. I, here, here's things that, that I think about. God looks at us. He says, I want you to be holy because I'm holy. 1 Peter 1.16. I, I am living inside of you, 1 Corinthians 3.16. And I want to feel at home inside you, right? So please walk in me and allow me to remove your dirt, 1 John 1, 7. Because I want to feel at home in your heart. I, I need you to understand what it means to be richly pure because you've removed the dirt or you've allowed me to remove the dirt and the, and the grossness. My Heart Christ Home, if you've never read that little book, I know we did that as a class quite a, quite a while ago. But it opened up my eyes so much. I mean, it is a quick read. It's one of those little bitty booklets, little bitty things. I mean, you can read it in, I don't know, a really short amount of time. Mark, can you give us those two citations again? First Peter um, 1.16, 1 Corinthians 3.16, and 1 John 1.7. 1 those are the three texts that, that, that I wrestled through just thinking through this. Now... My heart, Christ's home. Uh, now, let's, let's, let's look at this too. So, it, by the way, in verse 4, did they do it? Look at verse 4. Yes. Yeah, they did it. They did it. They did just as the Lord had instructed Moses. Now, if you remember, we said this the very first week. The first nine and a half chapters of Numbers, the people are extremely obedient. You see, over and over, they did exactly what God told them to do or exactly what Moses instructed. And then we get to the last part of the numbers. But the first nine and a half chapters, you see this over and over. Whatever God's telling them to do, they obey. And they, th this is no exception. They obeyed. Now, let's look at the next little bit. Numbers 5, uh, verses, starting at verse 5. The Lord then spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel when a man or woman commits any of the sins of mankind, acting unfaithfully against the Lord, and that person is guilty, then he shall confess his sins which he has committed, and he shall make restitution in full for his wrong, and add to it one-fifth of it, and give it to him who he has wronged. And it goes on from there. But, but it's this, this idea of the, if the camp's going to be holy, God knew there were certain issues that needs, needed to be addressed among the people. There needed to be a way for them to make this restitution, okay? There needed to be some issues addressed. But here's the thing. Look carefully at verse 6. If someone sins against someone else, what does it say? Who is he unfaithful to? The Lord. See, it's a lot bigger deal than if, if I have an issue with one of you in here, and oh, it's just us going against one another. It's a lot bigger than that. God says, understand, if you have an issue with one of the fellow believers, one of my people, the issue is not necessarily with them, it's against me. That's a lot bigger. That's, that's a big deal. Now, the one who committed the sin, this is what happened. First, that person had to confess. So they had to understand that I, I, I'm not right here. If I have an issue with somebody, I have to confess. Oh, I, I am in the wrong. There's some issue going on. And then it says in verse 7, he has to make a full restitution for a sin. Now, let's kind of think through that. Because in Leviticus 6, you see this in fullness. And we discussed this in great detail back when we talked about Leviticus 6. Okay? It's this idea of a guilt offering. Okay? Now... Let's kind of review very briefly, because I, I think you need to understand the guilt. You remember there's five different types of offerings in the Old Testament. Leviticus 1 through 6 goes through each one systematically. That's how Leviticus begins. Well, this guilt offering is a very unique type of offering. And so it, it is someone who, and you'll see this in Leviticus 6 verse 2, a guilt offering is given when somebody acts unfaithfully against the Lord. And he has just said... If you have a problem with somebody else that's a believer, the sin is against me. So yes, a guilt offering is, is due here. That word unfaithfully in that text means a breach against Yahweh. Now, against God. So here, here's the thing. 
in that text, in Leviticus 6, when it talks about a guilt offering, it's when you do something against somebody, you rob somebody, you, you hurt somebody, you, you're, all these sort of things, that's when you give this guilt offering. The same situation, if I have a problem against somebody here, God says, understand, that's a guilt offering issue because it's against me. It's not just against them. I created them. They're also a believer. Your issue is against me. So, and there's so much here because in the culture, in the Hebrew culture, you, you got to understand this part. I, I just, I'm trying to figure out what to leave out, but I just can't leave some of this stuff out. In the Hebrew culture, okay, if some, if, if Randall, there's a suspicion that he has deceived me or he's robbed me or something like that, okay, if there's this suspicion, that person has to take a solemn oath of innocence against God, saying, Basically, as God is my witness, my hand's on the Bible, I did not rob you or I did not deceive you or whatever the case may be. So if they lied under oath, that is why this is an oath against God himself. That's their culture. We don't necessarily do that. If we're having an issue and me and Donna are having an issue, I don't say, as God is my witness, I'm telling you what I'm telling you right now is true. I'm not like doing this solemn oath to God every time I'm talking to somebody. But they did. That's their culture. There's this solemn oath of innocence, okay? So that's why if you lied under the oath, guess what? You're swearing falsely in God's name. That's why it's a breach against Yahweh. That's why you do this guilt offering, okay? Hope that makes sense. So how does this work? Okay. Hmm. Let's skip that. Matthew, though, listen, Matthew 5, verses 23 and 24 God essentially says, don't make an offering unless you have made things right with each other. You know that text, right? Lay, lay your offering down. I'd rather go, go fix your relationship, okay? I don't know that we always take that seriously. How many of you, before you give your tithe this morning, are going to say, you know what? I need to make things right. That's what Jesus tells me to do. But you understand in their culture if there's an issue with each other, it's an issue with God. And we just look at it as, oh no, I can still worship God. There's no issue with me and God. It's me and him that I have an issue with. So me and God, we're good. And God says, that's impossible because you're all my body. So you can't have issue with one another and still worship me like nothing's going on. So this idea of restitution to me is so big. So in Numbers 5, God says, I need you to understand that. You need to understand that reconciliation is so important if you want to have a relationship with me. How much does it break God's heart to see his kids, his body, not getting along? I mean, as a, as a, as a parent, sometimes our kids, like, you know, <laughs> you talk to each kid and they tell, they tell you to their face that they don't like the other ones. That hurts. I mean, hopefully they're being joking somewhat, but it does kind of hurt when they're saying, you know, no, I, I care less about Nolan, or I care less about... Well, how much more so does it hurt God's heart? As we're like, you know what? I could care less about them. Me and God, we're good, but I could care less about them. Take them or leave them. This idea of reconciliation is so, so important because our faithfulness to the Lord is at stake. You want to be faithful to Yahweh? You want to be faithful to God? He says, understand, you've got to reconcile issues. You have to. So the rest of the chapter, and we're not going to get, I'm not going to read all of this. 11 through 31 deal with this test for an unfaithful wife. Now, why do you think this has to go back to their culture? Why do you think it's a test for an unfaithful wife? It sounds like, oh me, we're picking on the women now. There's not a test for an unfaithful man, but why, is it, why do you think, get in their culture, there's a, there's a reason behind it. We all think about God and the bridegroom and marriage. And okay. All instituted okay. by God. Okay. So a picture of that. Okay. But why just the wife? Think about what we talked about having standards and banners. Why would it be important to make sure there's purity in the family line? See, Jews say the reason why there's a test for an unfaithful wife is because you need purity in the lineage. 
Like if I know what the standard or banner is going to be for my family, I better have a pure line to get there. And so they, that's the reason why they point to it being the test of an unfaithful wife. Now, so outside of the do you think, that's a good question. That's a good question. If you're under the tribe of Dan, do you, do you now, I will say this. I'm not saying they didn't necessarily marry outside, but the, the purity of, let's say, the Levites. Is it important to know if you're in the Levitical family? Yes. Yeah, you're going to be carrying holy objects. So would there be issues if you didn't know where that family line traces back to? You're like, huh, am I supposed to be in Dan's family or Levi's family? You know, that, That's what Jews point to, that it's a, it's a purity issue of the lineage. Now, is that true? I don't know. I'm just, I like to give you food for thought in here. Okay, so don't take everything I say. Test it, look at it, go, go do your own research. I like to give you some food for thought because there are things I've never thought about. I start studying some of this stuff. I'm like, that's interesting. I wonder if there's anything to it. But, but it's not scriptural. Like, okay, God didn't say, now it's only for the unfaithful wife because I'm preserving the line. I mean, it's not what he says. So, so I just want to give you some food. For, now, here's the question. But what happens if the woman and man, the woman, the wife of the husband is caught in the act with another man? What happens scripturally? Good. You are dead on the spot, all right? So that's Leviticus 20, uh, verse 10, okay? Just so you want to know if you want to put that up on a mirror somewhere, okay? Leviticus 20, 10. So, so if, but if it's not caught in the act and the husband's like, you know what? I don't know about old, you know, the wife over here. I don't know if she's been faithful to me or not. Then there's this test. Now, it's an odd test. We've talked about it briefly. Go ahead, Sally. Can you just use these just one time? They can. No doubt. Well... Yes, that's right, that's right. Hey. But, uh, I remember you saying that before. There's, there's so much there. Right. Let's talk about the test real quick because I know we're running out of time. And, and, and some of you, we've briefly discussed this in the past. What story did we, we talk about this about? Do you remember? Moses. Yep. What, which story of Moses? He came down from Mount Sinai. What are the people doing? Yeah. yeah. Remember the golden calf? Ground up, mixed with water. Now, why? Now, 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 see the similarities between that and what you see in Numbers 5. If, if, if I'm thinking, okay, my wife has been unfaithful, okay, here's what you do. You take, it, take your wife to the priest, okay? So, you, so the first step is you take your wife to the priest, uh, and you tell him what's going on. And the first step is you make an offering, okay? Now, um, then the priest takes some holy water, it says in the scriptures, holy water, and mixes it with what? Dust. Dust from where? The tabernacle floor, okay? It sounds kind of weird. Kind of an odd science experiment, right? So water and, and this holy water. The priest loosens the hair on the woman, which different cultural reasons for that, okay? And, and, he, and she's put under this oath by the priest, basically saying, you know what? If you've committed adultery, you're going to have all this bad stuff happen to you. You're going to have um, water is going to curse you. Your womb's going to miscarry, and your abdomen's going to swell. Okay, that, that's what's going to happen if you're guilty. And the priest writes the curses on a scroll and washes that scroll in water. That's, that's just what it says. Okay, I don't, I don't have explanations for all this. Then he takes the offering, he waves it. Remember the wave offering? Waves the offering before the Lord. He offers this grain offering on the altar. And then the woman comes and drinks and everybody waits. Is she going to swell up? Is she going to be okay? Now... Here's the question. So who is the one that determines guilty or innocent? God. God. If God doesn't act, the Jews say this is the only time where if God doesn't act, 
the person's going to die every time. That's, that's just how they teach this, that you're mixing stuff together, and if God doesn't come through with a miracle, this person's dead because she's drinking holy water. And, and you, it, it, so so let's, let's get into that. So God is the one figuring out if Randall and I were having a disagreement, which one of, not, no, me and you, this is a wife deal. You're not my wife. But if this is a husband and wife thing, if, if there was an issue, he's the one deciding if she actually was guilty or innocent. Okay? Now, now, here's the thing. An, dust with the tabernacle. Do you understand? That is holy, holy ground. This woman is drinking two things. One is holy water. You can't drink holy water and live. Along with holy dust, holy ground. You're mixing those. T- you can't do that and live. It's not that this is a gross mixture and some sort of bacteria is going to infest her and her abdomen is going to swell and oh no. And it's not anything about that. It has nothing to do with that. It's this woman is taking in holy things. And if something doesn't happen, she is dead. God has to come through on her side. So she has to be pure. She has to be holy to walk away from this test. Now, there's actually an entire section in rabbinic literature talking about that, about this holy dust and holy water. Just so you know, if you want to read something this, after, this week, you can look up. There's a whole section of rabbinic literature uh, in, uh, in the Mishnah. Now, look at verse 27 with me, though. Look at verse 27. When he has made her drink the water, then it shall come about if she has defiled herself and has been unfaithful to her husband that the water will bring a curse, will go into her and cause bitterness, and her abdomen will swell and her thigh will waste away, and the woman will become a curse among her people. Does anybody have something different between a different translation that doesn't say her thigh will waste away, by the way? Does it say thigh? Anybody else have something else besides thigh? Okay, some translations say womb, some say thigh, because it's a Hebrew euphemism, okay? Remember the story of Abraham in Genesis where uh, he's needing to find a wife for his son, and and he has his servant put uh, his hand under his thigh? That wasn't his thigh he put his hand under, okay? That's a Hebrew euphemism, okay? So so it is the womb here, not like her thigh is going to cause issues. No, that's not her thigh that's the problem. It's her womb that's the problem. Okay? So anyway, just so you know, you read it, and we miss that because we're not in their culture. Okay? Sure. Same word. Same word. Now, now, and there may be a different thing. That it is the Hebrew word for thigh, but it's a euphemism in their culture for other things. So in context, you have to read it in context. You see what I'm saying? But it's the same word. So, so that's where it's tough because the thigh can mean the thigh. But in their culture, when it's talking about reproduction, not talking about the thigh. When it's talking about, hey, I want you to swear that my reproductive nature is you're going to find the right wife for my son. He didn't put his hand under his thigh. He, he put his hand where he's been circumcised, making a covenant. It's a covenant deal. Does that make sense? Abraham's been circumcised. He's had a covenant. And he... The, man, the servant's making a covenant with Abraham that, yes, I will do what I'm telling you. Now, we gotta, I know we've got to finish. But um, just think about it. Do you think the Israelites, every time they did this test, went back to Exodus 32 and the golden calf? God instituted an issue where he said, I want you to essentially do the same thing that I did with the golden calf right here. And every time an unfaithful wife comes up, have that same test. And every time Israel went back to think, oh, man, We've all blown it. We're we're all sinners. Every one of us made the mistake of going after other things. It's not just this woman. And it opens up old wounds. But anyway, last thing that I just wanted us to think of, as I know we've got to get out of here. Numbers 5 deals with purity. I don't know where you are this morning. The first thing it dealt with was physical purity. Is there things going on within you? that you know need to be purified so that you'll be richly pure before God. Second thing was relationships. Are there relationships that need reconciliation? Your faithfulness to God is at stake. And he says, you've got to reconcile. You're all my one body. And the third thing is the marriage is supposed to be a picture to the world of what it looks like to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. 
you know, issues that need to be worked through. God, I just thank you for this morning. I thank you so much for your word and how you continue to shape us into the men and women you called us to be. I pray, God, that whatever needs to be dealt with so that we can have community, communion with you, God, help us to take this seriously. God, thank you that you're the one that does it. It's not us. Oh, you're so good. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.